Hello and welcome to today's video from Tank Encyclopedia. I'm Sophie Line, and today I present this video voiceover for the article Sticky and Magnetic Anti-Tank Weapons. The written article for this video is linked in the description below. Check it out and subscribe to this channel for more educational videos on the subject of historical armored vehicles. Infantry taking on tanks is a real challenge. Infantrymen are, after all, mainly equipped with weapons primarily intended for killing enemy infantry. Anti-tank guns are large, cumbersome, and heavy, and so, right from the first days of the tank in World War I, the goal has been to produce a man-portable anti-tank weapon. One of the first, the Mauser Panzergewehr M1918, was little more than a scaled-up rifle designed to defeat relatively modest armor. More anti-tank rifles followed in the decades afterwards, up to the first years of World War II, but they all suffered from the same drawbacks. The rifles were so large and heavy, they would take at least one, often two men, to carry, without being able to carry the usual accoutrements of infantry work. On top of this, the performance was relatively modest. Only thinly armored vehicles were vulnerable, and anything with armor about 30 millimeters thick was relatively impervious to them. Smaller devices, the sort of device which could be issued to a standard soldier making him capable of knocking out a standard enemy tank, were, and still are, the gold standard for infantry anti-tank weapons. Grenades, small explosive devices were useful, but were primarily to spray fragments over an area to target infantry. Their effect was relatively limited against armored vehicles unless you could get the explosives in direct contact with the tank, and one way to do this was to make the explosives stick to the vehicle. Tanks, being made of steel, lent themselves to an obvious thought. Why not make the explosive charge magnetic? Here, there are two distinguishing elements, throwing and placing. Grenades, as throwing weapons, are advantageous for the soldier, as they permit the user to maintain a distance from the target. The smaller and lighter to a point the grenade, the further it can be thrown. This also means that the features of an effective grenade against armor are also challenged. The size of the charge used is inherently going to be small, with larger charges being harder to throw and therefore of shorter range. The next is accuracy. The further an item being thrown, the lesser the chance of hitting the target. Of course, a smaller grenade is also easier to carry and deploy. A charge, on the other hand, such as an attachable mine, has to be placed on the target. This allows for the significant advantage of a large charge, shaped if possible to optimize anti-armor performance, but which would not lend itself to being thrown. A further advantage of the place charge is also the obvious one. It guarantees a hit because it does not have to be thrown and risk hitting and bouncing off the target. The disadvantages are equally obvious. The man has to expose himself to enemy fire to place the charge, has to be uncomfortably close to the enemy tank, and they are also larger and heavier than a grenade to contain enough explosives to do effective damage, meaning fewer of them can be carried. All of the various attempts to develop either a hand place charge or a thrown charge suffered from these problems, and none adequately managed to overcome them. Such a relatively simple idea, though, was far easier to manage than it was to turn into a functional weapon. Some experience in the area could be drawn from naval warfare. There, a magnetically attached charge had been developed by the British as a means of sabotaging enemy ships, the limpet mine. A relatively small explosive device adhering to the steel of a ship's hull could burst a seam or plate and cause enough damage to put it out of action until it was patched. The power of the charge was magnified if it was placed below the waterline, as the pressure of the water helped to magnify the explosive power of the charge, and obviously, a hole above the waterline was less useful at crippling a ship. For the British, the work on the underwater anti-ship charges found its way both in style and name to a land weapon. The clam, as it was called, originally came with a light steel body, Mark I, later replaced with a bakelite plastic body, Mark II, with four small iron magnets, one in each corner. Resembling a large bar of chocolate, this charge contained a modest charge of just 227 grams of explosive. This charge was a 50-50 mix of cyclonite and TNT, or 55% TNT with 45% tetral. Although the device was magnetic, the charge was not shaped nor specifically designed for breaching armor plate. The utility of the mine was for sabotage. Enemy infrastructure, vehicles, railway lines, and storage tanks made excellent targets for this mine. The clam was able to breach just 25 millimeters of armor, offering little compared to far simpler anti-tank weapons, such as the number 82 gammon bomb or number 73 grenade, aka the thermos bomb. Both of these were weapons which could be thrown from a safe distance, exploded on impact, and were far simpler to make. The clam, therefore, found a role in sabotage where it was very effective. Large quantities were produced in Britain and shipped to the Soviet Union for exactly that purpose. The most famous or infamous anti-tank grenade is probably the British Sticky Bomb. Although not magnetic, the Sticky Bomb, officially known as the Number 74 ST Mark I HE, was constructed from a glass sphere containing 567 grams of nitroglycerin and covered with a stockinet fabric to which an adhesive was applied. 
Once the protective steel shells around the grenade had been removed, it could be thrown at an enemy tank. When the bulbous glass ball at the end struck the tank, it would break, causing the nitroglycerin inside to cow pat on the armor and remain stuck there by the glued stockinet until it was detonated. The weapon was not a success, but was also made in large numbers and saw service in North Africa and Italy against German and Italian forces. Probably the most famous magnetic anti-tank device was the German Haftoladung, handheld hollow charge. These came in different sizes, although the most common weighed in at 3 kilograms. This Haftoladung mine used three large magnetic feet to adhere to the armor of a vehicle. Each permanent horseshoe-shaped magnetic foot, made from Alnico-type alloy, had an adhesion strength of 6.8 kilograms equivalent, meaning over 20 kilograms of force equivalent would have to be used to remove a well-adhered mine, and that also, only a single foot was needed to stick the mine to a steel surface. The 3 kilogram Haftorladung contained a simple 1.5 kilogram shaped charge, consisting of PETN and wax. Placed by hand on the target, the positions of the magnets ensured that the shape charge, when detonated, would strike the armor perpendicularly and at an optimal standoff distance to maximize its anti-armor potential. According to British tests in 1943, the 3kg charge could perforate up to 110mm of IT ATD armor plate, or 20 inches of concrete, meaning that it could defeat any allied tank then in service, almost regardless of where it might be placed. A later and slightly heavier model of this mine weighing 3.5 kilograms contained up to 1.7 kilograms of 40% full pulver 2 and 60% hexagen explosive, which was capable of defeating over 140 millimeters of armor. A post-war British report stated that versions of this type of grenade were known in 2, 3, 5, 8, and even 10 kilogram versions. An even larger version of the Haftorladung was made for the German Luftwaffe, known as the Panzerhandmine, or sometimes as the Haft HL. This device had the appearance of a small wine bottle, with the base cut off to make room for six small magnets. Larger than the Haftorladung, the PHM-3 still had to be applied by hand. A small spiked steel ring was fixed to the bottom of the magnets so that the charge could be stabbed onto a wooden surface too. In order to fasten to a steel surface, all that was required was the removal of this ring. First appearing in about 1942, the PMH-3, a 3 kilogram version, contained a shape charge made from 1.06 kilograms of TNT, or a 50-50 cyclonite TNT mix. Against a steel target, this charge was sufficient to pierce up to 130 millimeters, making it a very serious threat against a tank. A 4 kilogram version, PHM-4, was also developed, with a performance of up to 150 millimeters, although details are very limited. A variant of this mine also had a sticky foot with different mixtures of explosive compositions. The sticky versions had the advantage of being able to stick to any solid surface, regardless of whether it was magnetic or not. In this way, it was emulating the British idea of an adhesive impregnated fabric behind a thin steel cover. Containing a 205 gram filling of 50% RDX and 50% TNT, the entire charge weighed just 418 grams, just over a pound. Able to penetrate an IT-80 homogeneous steel plate 125mm thick, this small mine was a very effective weapon in terms of penetration, although how many were made or used is unknown. A further variation of this grenade allowed it to be thrown, relying on the stickiness to attach to the armor with an instant fuse and small streamer behind to ensure it landed sticky side down. No other details are known. Another variation for a hand-placed sticky charge from the Germans was more complex than just an adhesive impregnated fabric. This version featured the same sort of thin protective cover, but with the detonator as part of the sticky process. Here, once the detonator was pulled, it would create an exothermic reaction, melting the plastic on the face to make it sticky. It was, at this point, live, so it had to be applied or discarded as it would then blow up. No known use of this particular device or live examples are known. One further German magnetic charge was the 3 kg Gebalte Ledung, or concentrated charge. Demolition charge, which was little more than a large box with magnetic panels on each side. The interior was filled with cubes of explosives and had the additional advantage of being throwable. Even if the magnets failed to adhere to the steel of the tank, the 3 kilogram charge was sufficient to cause a lot of damage and possibly cripple the vehicle. However, as it was not a shape charge, the anti-armor performance was relatively poor. Even so, it was more than capable of knocking out the Soviet T-34 and capable of sticking on the target even when thrown, but few other details are known. Many of these German shape charge devices were made by the firm of Krummelfabrik Dynamite AG, which, after a lot of trials, found that the best mix for shape charges was the explosive cyclotol, which was made up of 60% cyclonite and 40% TNT, with other mixtures producing less efficient results. 
Under ideal conditions, they found that a 3 kg shape charge with this explosive could penetrate up to 250 mm of armor, although ideal conditions were rarely to be found on the battlefield. Either way, and despite numerous attempts at both magnetic and sticky anti-tank weapons, the Germans did not deploy them in significant numbers. One British report of late 1944 even confirmed that they had, to that point, yet to confirm that even a single Allied tank had been knocked out by a magnetic mine. The far bigger threat being the German bazooka, the Panzerfaust. The Japanese, like the Germans and to a lesser extent the British, had experimented with magnetic anti-tank weapons. Unlike both of them though, Japan was successful. The primary magnetic anti-tank weapon was the deceptively simple Model 99 Hakubakurai turtle mine. Reminiscent in shape to a turtle, with four magnets sticking out like feet and the detonator looking like the head, this canvas-covered circular mine was a potent threat to Allied tanks in the Pacific theater of operations. Appearing on the battlefield from 1943 onwards, the Hakubakurai weighed just over 1.2 kilograms and was filled with 0.74 kilograms of cast blocks of cyclonite TNT arranged in a circle. Placed against thin points of armor or on the hatch of a tank, this mine, when detonated, could penetrate 20 millimeters of steel plate. With one mine on top of another, this could be increased to 30 millimeters, although depending on the armor it was on, it could cause damage to a plate thicker than that. The mine was not a shaped charge, and 20 or even 30 millimeters of armor penetration was not much use against anything but the lightest of allied tanks deployed against the Japanese, such as the M3 Stewart, unless they were placed in a vulnerable spot such as underneath, on the rear, or over a hatch. However, British testing and examination of these mines reported that although the penetration was poor, just 20 millimeters, the shockwave from the blast could scab off the inner face of an armor plate up to 50 millimeters thick, although the penetration was still limited by it not being a shaped charge. The result also did not include vehicles designed with an inner skin either, but the results were still substantial, as it meant that all of the Allied tanks used in the Pacific theater were vulnerable to these mines depending on where they were placed. A further development of it, known as the Kyushake Bakurai, was rumored and capable of being thrown up to 10 yards, or 9.1 meters, although, as of October 1944, no examples were known to have been found. The Japanese had, from about May 1942, obtained shape charge technology from the Germans, and the results were first recorded by the Americans following combat in New Guinea in August 1944. Here, they reported finding a Japanese shape charge weapon shaped like a bottle and fitted with a magnetized base, very similar in description of the German Panzerhandmine. As of October 1944, though, the British, aware of this weapon, had still not encountered any. The Kingdom of Italy, perhaps contrary to common knowledge, also made use of two devices of note. The first of these was a close copy of the British No. 74 ST Mark I HE grenade reproduced from examples captured from the British in North Africa. The Italian version, known as the Model 42 grenade, was manufactured in limited numbers by the firm of Bretta and OTO, but importantly, was not sticky. The Italians simply copied the large spherical explosive charge and omitted the not-so-reliable sticky stockinette and glass bulb part of the design. One important note on a heavy grenade like this is the range, just 10 to 15 meters at best. Although the Model 42 was neither sticky nor magnetic, the Italians did develop probably the most advanced man-portable magnetic anti-tank weapon of all. Here, though, there is very little to go off. Just a single photograph is known of the device consisting of a small battery pack and charge on a simple frame. The mine is relatively small, perhaps only 30 centimeters wide, and appears to consist of a bell-shaped central charge, almost certainly a shaped charge with a rectangular battery and two large electromagnets on the ends of the steel frame. Certainly, this would have some advantages, as it would not be magnetic all the time. Unlike the German Tafterladung, it was simply placed on a tank and the switch was flicked to activate the battery and the powerful electromagnets would hold the charge in place until it detonated. At least one prototype was made in 1943, but with the collapse of Italy in September of 1943, all development is believed to have ceased. Perhaps even more obscure than the Italian work on the subject of magnetic weapons is a single known Yugoslavian example. Known as the Mina Prilepka Provozhna, it was developed after the war and was intended for disabling non-combat and light combat vehicles rather than main battle tanks. It could also be deployed in the manner of the clam for sabotage purposes on infrastructure. It consisted of a cylinder with a cone on top containing a 270 gram hexatol shape charge and was capable of piercing up to 100 millimeters of armor plate. Packed 20 to a crate, the MPP was a potent small mine, but there is little information available on it in general outside of a small manual of arms. How many were made, and whether it was ever used or not, is not known. None of the attempts to produce a smaller anti-tank explosive weapon using either sticky or magnetic principles were shown to be effective. The magnetic charges required the soldier to be often suicidally close to the enemy tank. The sticky option permitted the chance to be further away and possibly have the grenade hopefully strike the vehicle where the charge could perforate the armor. Many other ideas for hand-thrown anti-tank weapons were fielded by various armies in World War II and thereafter, such as an attempt as a top-attack hollow charge similar to that of the German Panzerhandmine SS, but 
none were particularly successful. A short range, inconsistent defects, and a huge question over accuracy were not the reasons these devices do not appear in today's army's arsenals, though. The answer is that far simpler, more reliable, and more effective systems became available. The German Panzerfaust had, by the end of the war, reached a level of performance where a soldier could be up to 250 meters from a target and perforate up to 200 millimeters of armor. The modern rocket-propelled grenade, or RPG, really embodies this change in military thought for anti-armor weapons, and appears in multiple forms for decades, providing an enormous punch for the average soldier against armor. That's all for this video. Make sure to like, subscribe, and hit that bell button. We'll be releasing new videos on the regular. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or Reddit. If you use Discord, there's a link to our community server in the description. And if you would like to help us continue to develop and expand, please consider donating on Patreon or PayPal. All of the funds will be used to help us enhance and design new articles and features for you. Until next time, keep us in your sights.